everyone. I'm Sarah Marintz. I'm a voiceover actress and also on-camera actress, and I'm so excited to be here with you for our second episode of Crew Talk. And today we're going to be talking about getting started in video and film, and I have three awesome people on the panel with me. I have Robin Kincaid, Debbie Brubaker, and Joel Janicek. Sorry about that, Joel. Um, And so we're really, really glad to have the three of you here. I think this is going to be a very informative chat, and I have a list of questions that Um, I have prepared and then we're going to take some of our viewers questions at the end so viewers if you have some questions that you're thinking about during the session go ahead and type them in the chat box as this is going on and we will get to those during the end so um, all right I guess we'll just start with our first question and anyone can jump in and answer this one Um, you guys can you know play off of each other with these answers and questions so if each one of you just wants to kind of tell us a little bit about yourself how you got started in the industry and really what was your attraction to this field? Who wants to start? Deb, you start. Me? Okay. I started making movies when I was about 13 years old. I decided that that's what I wanted to do. I actually had decided when I was about 11, that's what I wanted to do. And I started doing still photography and I started making my own movies and then I went to school and then I went to school for film and my parents thought I was crazy. Well, I didn't, I, it's all I ever, it's all, really, it's all I've ever done. Okay, right, putting this in airplane mode. I don't know, what was the rest of the question? <laughs> Just what attracted you to the field? But that, that was a great answer. It sounds like it was your passion from day one. That's kind of what you always wanted to do. My grandfather. Um, my grandpa was a projectionist. Okay. And I, when I was little, he I spent a lot of time in movie theaters. He babysat, and I got to. And I was in the projection booth a lot, which was very loud. I'm amazed I still have my hearing. <laughs> but uh, he, um, you know, he he made it very magical for me, and um, you know, it was it was one of those things that I just I really got hooked on it at a very young age. Awesome. And Robin, what about you? Well, I didn't have that path. Um, I actually had no idea to get into the, to the, what I would call the media. It wasn't necessarily films. Um, I actually don't work films. I work almost everything but. And I was, I was just working in a, in a lumber mill, actually, up in Northern California on a, on a really difficult job. That had, you know, no, it was boring and hard and physically difficult, good money, but there was no way that that was going to last. And um, I was fortunate enough to be working next to somebody that was a mentored me and, and kind of said, well, well why, don't, why don't you try getting a job in the media? And I thought that would, that sounded good. And I started in a small television station. And I worked my way through every job in that station and eventually uh, went to work for a uh, clothing company that had 23 stores up and down the Northern California coast. And I did all of their print, television, and radio for four years. And then I broke into um, the freelance market as a production assistant and worked my way up through there down in Sacramento and now in San Francisco. Wow, wonderful. And Joel, what about you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think like similarly, I sort of had a little bit of a, uh, performance background or something like that. I, you know, my parents met in a local theater production and I did a lot of acting as a kid. Um, but then I, I would say, you know, when I was sort of wondering what I might do with my life and, you know, using a junior college to sort of take some different classes, um, up in Santa Rosa, I, um, I started taking video production classes and just fell in love with it, you know, being excited, done even a few plays in college, but then, um, you know, being able to sort of have a, you know, out of the box idea, execute that with a video camera and a couple buddies, um, that, and then, you know, just while away the hours in the editing room, see it come together, see, you know, my friends and fellow theater nerd audiences react. Um, that was really fun. And then I realized, okay, then there's probably some jobs in this. This, this might be a good major. It got me a lot more serious about school. And, um, then I went to San Francisco state, um, which was, a, you know, I was just lucky because I was living in the Bay area, but, um, San Francisco state was just the perfect, uh, film school for me. Um, and I had a lot of, uh, a lot of good experiences there. And one thing I wanted to do while I was there, uh, they encouraged a lot of like experimental filmmaking, doc, you know, personal filmmaking. I wanted to make like a 
a commercial piece. Um, also, and I made a, I made a piece for a, a company I was working for, kind of like a supplement to a catalog of video for that. And then um, one day uh, I met someone who was a producer at Oracle uh, in the video department and uh, I showed her that piece and she said, hey, great, we, we really need producers there. So I started doing corporate video and then uh, did a bunch of uh, local production, uh, local origination. I worked for uh, on a bunch of different TV shows um, that, that come out of the local origination space in, uh, in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, had a great time there. Uh, so that was, uh, you know, co- going to the city and uh, getting into film school was uh, was was really really great for me. That was a nice start. Yeah, very nice. And then I went to LA, and then now I hate the industry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was it difficult for you guys to get your like break, like your first big break into in the industry? You know, LA is like. I think everyone kind of, you know, you can go to film school and I think if you go to like a USC um, or like a Cal arts or something like that, if you're, if you're entering it from sort of like above the line aspirations, um, then, you know, you're going to have an easier time breaking into the mainstream like film and television industry. Um, But if, uh, you know, for, for me, like after I had been in the Bay area for about five years, I was sort of in my mid to latest twenties and I'm, okay if I don't like go to a major market now LA or New York um, and I had a couple friends in LA I, th- I figured you know I might as well go down there and see what that world has to offer or, or I might regret it you know um, and so you know going down there I didn't know anyone and I just really pressed the flesh and and followed up with people and you know getting those first couple opportunities it took a lot and, and it really was from like friends of family who knew someone who knew someone I was willing to make those cold calls and and, and those are, that was the only way I really got some of the opportunities I, I had down there. I was able to build some more mainstream credits and stuff like that. What about you, Robin? Uh, for me, it's a series of breaks. So it wasn't one, one. The first break was the actual first job, which was like a, you know, because I had no experience. I'm working in a lumber mill. I have no college, right? So I'm coming from the other, other side. And um, all I really wanted was adventure. I, I really wasn't even remotely concerned with the end product, to be quite honest. I wanted to get to know the, all of the people in the, in the thing, and that was a huge break. Then the other break I got was once I got into Sacramento, I became a location scout from a PA. Getting out of the PA world into your first real job, that was hard. That took a long time in that market at that time. And the only reason that happened is somebody messed up on a job and they had let that person go. And it's that typical thing. Oh, my gosh, who are we going to bring in? Right. And my name had been floated around. I'd been in the market as a PA. I'd done enough jobs as a PA. What about Robin Kincaid? And they called me and that was a huge break. And then the last one was coming into San Francisco market. That's a very difficult market to hit because it's a wonderful market to work. I don't know what L.A. is like, but I tell you what, we are a community here. And we love each, I mean, I, I have love in this community and we do a lot of projects together that are super fun, but breaking in is tough because nobody leaves. Nobody goes. Unless be first. <laughs> <laughs> so what I, I had to do is I had to create my own business here. So what I did is I got on, on I started watching daytime TV and, and, and television that was cable and reaching out to those cable companies and saying, hey, I have a house. You guys want this? I'm a producer. I can send me a crew. I'll make you a show. I'll make you a, a part of this. You know, uh, or you can put this. And they picked it up. So like Old Homes Restored or Dream Builders. And that was the second big break for me. Ah, oh, Nice. Debbie, do you have a story you'd like to share? Well, it's funny because I think, you know, I also went to San Francisco State once upon a time, probably a long time before you did, Joel. And most of the instructors there are, were full-time and they were tenured, but not all of them were. Some of them were actually people that were filmmakers. And one of them that I had as an instructor, his name was Irving Seraph, and he worked at... Uh, he had just finished doing One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, that, sort of, that dates me, 
and he was also a documentary filmmaker, and I was very, very interested in documentary film at the time. So after I graduated, right, at, pretty much I got work right away. Um, I started in the camera department, and I was working in the camera department, and I, um, and I got, and then I, I switched into production management. And when I made that switch, you know, Irving also hired me to help him with his documentary. So I, I had someone to to work with like right away, and then I just. It took off from there, but I owe a lot to Irving and Allie Light, um, Irving Seraph and Allie Light, for really, you know, putting a lot of faith in me and, and bringing, them, bringing me into their world of documentary filmmaking. And then after I had done that for a while, I, I decided to go into, I really wanted to go into narrative film, and I, it was easy for me to make that jump. And so... Um, and it's 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 a little more complicated than that, but it was really it was I, I was very lucky, I think. I met a lot of really great people that really um, helped me uh, transition from being a student to being a professional. Nice. So, what are some um, tips or like pieces of advice you would give to somebody who's looking to get into the film or video industry? Well, one of the things I think that's, you know, one of the, the methods is to learn as much as you can. You know, you know, Robin has a course that she's created for PAs, which I think is really very good. I also recommend, you know, if you can, go to school. I mean, I, I, I'm an advocate for uh, San Francisco City College because they have a two-year cinema program. And if you live in the city, it's free. Um, it's a free school, and it, it has a, it's one of the best-kept secrets, I think, in the whole country in terms of its um, level of education you can get going to school there. I mean, right now, because we have, uh, we've been shut down more or less, and the classes have gone on. I, I teach a class there one night a week in production planning, which is ostensibly producing. And it's been, it's, it'll be online next semester, because I switched to online in March when we got, um, when the shit hit the fan. But, the, um, but it's really a great place to meet other people. Who are like-minded is is going to school or taking a class and making those connections. Um, if you can get if you can um, join a, a some kind of a film club. There's Scary Cow. There's in the Bay Area. There's Bay Area Video Coalition, um, the San Francisco Film Society. If you can volunteer in places like that, people who volunteer in organizations that are connected to what they want to do are 50% more likely to get a job than people who don't. And that's actually how I got work too, is that I volunteered at an organization called the Film Arts Foundation. And then I actually got a job there for a couple of months. And after that, that also helped my career. So there's so many different ways, but I'd say educate yourself about the industry is probably the number one thing. Yeah, education is great too for like, it, trying out some different hats, you know, you might think, oh, well, you know, maybe I don't want to be on set all the time, but, uh, you know, 12 hours standing around this weird place is not really for me, but I loved ha you know, bringing it all together in post-production, you know, and I think that like, you know, and I was able to just, you know, edit for 15 hours at a time. And I just, I felt like I was there for 10 minutes, you know? So when you, when you go and, you know, take a class or whatever and try on those different roles and see what it's like, then you can, I mean, that's something I really got a lot out of in school was just, you know, experimenting with the different roles, seeing what, what, I, what, what I was naturally attracted to, what I wasn't, you know, um, and it's, uh, that's really helpful and part of education too. You know, it's funny when I was at, um, San Francisco State, one thing I really liked was putting on film forums, and we did one with Les Blank, who you guys may know. Um, Debbie, you probably knew Les well. Um, and, and at the time, this is one of the great things about going to a school like SF State, which is, by the way, the only film school in the top 20 ranked film schools that is a state school. Um, and uh, so Les Blank his friend Werner Herzog, he had made a documentary called Werner Herzog Eats a Shoe. And Werner, this is not, this is pre-Werner Herzog fame. He had only, he had done next to nothing. He had done Fitzcarraldo, I think, was his biggest, was his biggest um, 
uh, credit. And so we had Les and Werner and they came in and did this whole thing. And I got to meet them both and get to know them a little bit. And, um, and so the, the, the people in, in the, uh, the forum, which was packed in the theater, they asked Werner Herzog, they said, well, what, what should someone do to get experience as a, as a, in the industry? And he said, <laughs> walk, from San Francisco to Mexico with nothing in your pockets and figure out a way to get there. <laughs> that was his piece of advice, which I thought was, was kind of interesting. And it kind of gets to that, like, make it happen. Uh, and you, no matter what kind of uh, mentality you need to have. What I, what I would say, uh, both of those are great answers. Um, you know, look around your community. You can actually uh, pick up production assistant work uh, from events, from sporting arenas, from uh, different projects that are happening in your community. You can volunteer, as Debbie said. Start small. Just as Joel said, you, you need to get a taste of things. So, for instance, in my course, I have Hilton Day. Hilton is a, a, a pretty successful assistant director. He travels all over the country. He's worked on The Black, Last Black Man in San Francisco, a lot of different films. He wanted to be an editor. So he started to be, he was a PA for a while. And when he was a PA, he found out that he loved assistant directing. And that's what he started doing. But to immediately get in, to immediately say, okay, I want to do this. I want to do this. And this is because we're in a big change right now. A lot of things are changing. And with great change comes great opportunity. I would say work your connections. See if you can get on any kind of a job where you can call yourself a production assistant, and put it on your resume. Then get another one. Put that one on your resume. And then start selling yourself as that person that can come and be a PA. And once you start doing that, you'll start getting paid for those jobs, and it becomes self-sufficient, and then you can learn. You can get yourself into school at night, because that's what I did. I went to community colleges. I took night classes, and I worked in the day. And it's a real doable thing. It's not that hard. But you do have to be consistent. And you have to have a really good winning attitude. The attitude is key. Attitude is everything. <laughs> it is. It really, really is. <laughs> it is. Um, Robin, you have touched on your course uh, a few times. Can you tell us a little bit about your production assistant course and um, a little bit like why did you make the course and how people can benefit from it? So uh, I, I was a production assistant for three years in Sacramento and it was really hard. I had no information of what was expected of me in the field. There was just nothing out there. And so about five years ago, I decided to uh, every night just sit for an hour and write about a production assistance. And, what, and, it, and it started as one course and it ended up being five courses. So it's a series. And I, I just followed it through and produced it and launched it in January. And what it does is it, it fills that gap between whatever school you have whether that's a four-year degree or, uh, from high school or a four-year degree from college or two-year, it fills the gap between that and your first job as a PA in the film business, breaking into the film business as specifically a PA in any market, whether you're in L.A. or you're in Salt Lake or you, you're in Cincinnati or wherever, in any market, there's work. And we all know this. There's, work, there's these little jobs, these little gems that you can get and start building your career. And that's what this does. It makes you a successful PA. Now, where you take it from there is up to you. But you'll know when you come on the set what, you, what you're not supposed to do, what you're supposed to do, what lockdown means, what petty cash and how to process it, what craft services is and how you're specifically going to help them, how to roll a cave. All of these things are in the course. That's fantastic. And so it sounds like everything you need to know. And people can find that on your website? They can. They can find that on my website. And um, we give away three free videos so they can kind of see what the production value is like. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited because I, I wrote this for myself 30 years ago, basically. I would have loved, it would have been way faster, way attitude things like that. Man, that's a, once I learned the attitude thing, then it went much better. But the attitude is huge. And it's not just being nice. It's not that. There's a certain attitude that people are looking for in crews. And it's that I'm, I'm plugged in. I'm paying attention. I'm here. What do you need? All the time. 
That's what standing by is. I'm here. What do you need? And sometimes anticipating that need without getting in the way. That's, that is hard. You know, it's a really hard thing. So we talk a lot about that kind of stuff. And I have over 20, Debbie's in the course. I have over 20 professionals. It's not just me yammering about what I think. I actually went out and interviewed other PAs and directors and producers and craft services people and, and uh, assistant directors and uh, art directors of what they're looking for in PAs and, and what it makes a good PA. So it's a real rounded education about how to be successful in this one job. Not to be a deep, the director of photography, not to be an editor or assistant director, how to be a successful production assistant so you can move into the next job quicker. That sounds fantastic. It really, really does. And um, one thing that you had mentioned is that there's work in every market, like, you know, big jobs, small jobs, whatever. But how important is it to be in New York or LA or Atlanta where you hear now that all the filming is happening? What do you guys think? Well, I'll take it and then I'll hand it over to these guys and they can tell you. I think if you're first starting out, it's better to, to be where people know you and you know people. Go down to the CVS over here and get me five la di da da Well, I don't know where that's. I'm new to town. Where's that CVS? I don't know. Nobody knows you in New York. Nobody knows you in L.A. You have no experience. If you're trying to get your first experience, get it where you live. And then get something under you. Get a little base. And then do your research before you run off to those cities because – you know, L.A. can be rough. Uh, the Bay Area is difficult to break into. This is not an easy place. There's a lot of people that want to do this kind of work here. That's my, that's my advice. I mean, I, I have to say that I, I broke in here and never left. So, you know, I, I have worked other places. I'm very familiar with the, the Los Angeles scene. I almost took a job in Atlanta. Um, and I know New York pretty well. I, you know, spent some time in Brooklyn and, and know people there too. But, you know, it, it's hard for me to leave here because this is my home. So, you know, I think that people can make it in their own home if they want to. I don't think that you have to leave necessarily. It just depends. Like, Joel, you said that you went to L.A. to check it out. And I, and I know a lot of other people. I've lost so many people to Los Angeles. I mean, you know, L- the, the Los Angeles scene, it's, it's, it's definitely a big draw for people. I think that Deb- or Robin made a good point about you know, getting a little bit of experience first um, and then you know, going out there is, is, is really helpful. Going there totally blind with no onset experience. Um, Los Angeles is not a great place for that. Um, but you know, I, I found for me, like going to a major market um, like Los Angeles was really handy. Um, I made you know connections that'll be with me for the rest of my life. I think that's probably the most valuable uh, thing I got out of that. Um, and I, I think that you know the. LA, there's so much happening there, especially nowadays with all of the um, internet and the streaming services. Uh, There's just a lot going on down there. So I think if you want to really be at like the epicenter of the craft, um, you know, LA and and actually New York too, um, are are, are really where it's at. Um, And I think that, you know, LA LA, you know, they always say that LA is a place you, you move to hating and learn to love. And San Francisco is a place you move to loving and learn to hate. <laughs> but the, um, but you know, LA is, it's got a lot to offer, but you really need to do some research first, figure out, you know, what neighborhood you kind of want to live in. And, you know, and really think about like where you want to go. LA has got so many people coming in that if you are like, well, I can do this and I can do this, especially when I first moved down there, that was a bit of a detriment. Um, now it's a little bit better um, because, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's people are starting to be able to, can you do a little bit of this and can you do a little bit of that is, is more uh, in demand down there now. But, um, you know, it's, it's a neat place. I think there's a lot of people that go there to realize their dream and they do kind of get there a little bit. Like I used to produce corporate videos uh, for the Mattel Corporation and boy, just seeing all those people there, they did like come to be toy designers from around the world. They've realized their dream and, and they're loving it. All the people that like move there to ride on shows. And once they achieve that, it's great. There's a lot of people that don't, 
but um, that can be sometimes a, a little depressing. But overall, I think it's, you know, and it's also a place where it's easy to be broke. I think that New York's a lot harder to be broke than, than LA. Um, and, you know, so if, especially if you're from California and you're a day's drive away from maybe, maybe you know, the, your parents or something like that, I think that, you know, LA is a great option. Uh, I know I've recommended a few people um, that were, you know, go, you know, go down, if you want to do this, go to USC, get do the whole thing and they ended up really really loving it um and so you know i, I I've, I've had good experiences but boy you've got to drop your shyness at the door the minute you cross uh, into that town and and just be willing to call anyone knock on any door and uh and re- you're gonna have to promote yourself the entire time you're there all great advice okay so i'm gonna ask you all three of you in your own words, how would you define the role of a production assistant? Like across departments, what kind of PAs are there? For example, in post, you'd have a post assistant or assistant editor. Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, there's so many. Gosh, Deb, you start. Well, I was going to say a po- an assistant editor is not a PA. Yeah, they don't have a lot of PAs in post, do they? Well, it sort of depends on the size of the department and the show you're working on. Uh huh. So, um, but the, the but you're right about that. They don't have a lot of post PAs. It's it's you know an assistant editor is not usually a PA. They are an assistant editor. It's a different place scale. It's a different job set. Um, the um, you know I could talk about television and motion pictures. Um, you know we have there's it's there's a hierarchy you know, in PAs on television and motion pictures, because you'll have a key set PA, and then you'll have some, and then you'll probably have a walkie-talkie PA, and you'll have a, um, you know, PAs that work with um, the back people that do background, you know, the, the, the assistant directors will have certain PAs that they help have helping them run background, as opposed to PAs that are just going to be all-purpose PAs. Um, it's it there's a there's a you know people will get start getting assigned you know to sort of different spots depending on what their skill set is pa to the talent right pa to the talent well pa to the talent is a specific job you know and it's it's not that's somebody that you, you people get hired to do that to be specifically for that right yeah yeah yeah. I mean, I have a PA that I work with a lot that I um, was instrumental in helping her get a job working on The Matrix as Keanu Reeves' assistant. And it was an, it was an amazing experience for her. And she did, and she, and it was really a, a game changer for her. She really, really, she had to, she had to really step up and she did. She, you know, they were, they took her to Germany with them and then the, 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 the pandemic happened and she she uh, barely made it back, but she did. I mean, Keanu brought her back on his private jet. Wow. So, you know, it, it, that's a whole different kind of job. But there's a, but, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say this about the markets. Hollywood's about to change. <laughs> Hollywood's about to change in a big, big way, everybody. The, the, what you know now is not, or what you thought you knew before we were into this COVID-19 thing is a, there was, there was already a lot of earthquakes happening in Hollywood in the way that the power struggles were going on. And I think it's going to change even more after this. I think that the way that the movies are presented is changing because of streaming. Mm. I think that the industry will change. And I think that Pete, that, that, we won't have as many hubs as we thought we did because runaway production will continue to run away. So it won't just be Atlanta. It won't just be New York. And it won't just be Los Angeles. It, there's going to be a lot. There's going to be a lot going on everywhere. I think, I think more places are going to start uh, picking up and depend, I think it's going to be, you know, uh, Australia and Canada, and I think they're still going to be doing a lot of work there. I mean, if you can work in, um, you know, if you can go to Vancouver, I mean, that's that's where you really get work. So if you want to, instead of thinking nationally, if you want to start thinking globally, that's probably a smarter way to think. Because our world just shrank. 
in a huge way, and it's going to be it's going to continue to shrink. Hmm. Joel, do you have anything to add? You know, just in terms of like entry entrance into industry, maybe maybe just like expanding out from like the, the production assistant role. You know, I think that like you know, if people are thinking about you know what you know, I might like to get involved with this. What, what are what are some good avenues for me to come in as? You know, you can you know work see who you know and see if they need assistance, you know, um, it, you know, can I, can I be a producer's assistant? Can I be a talent assistant? Can I be a, a you know, assistant to maybe an agent or something like that, depending on, on where you want to come in from. Um, and then also, you know, in post-production where there's quite a bit of work. And I think that like, if you, you know, a lot of people become great editors and they kind of move into directing. Um, and so if you are, you know, great with computers and um, really, like editing, you know, then working your way up as an assistant editor can be really great. There's a lot more like regular employment in that, in that world. It's probably a little easier to have a family if you're in post-production, for example. Um, so, you know, editing can be just a great skill that can, you can sort of end up coming into um, production with. And um, yeah, so, I mean, I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of different points of entry uh, where you can get a ton of good information. I know for me, like having some sort of audiovisual tech skills was really good. I ended up doing a lot of like, I just ended up being a production manager on some different shows um, just because I could sort of hire the right kind of camera ops. I, I understood, you know, what was going on with the switcher. I understood, um, you know, how to, how to get the rental package from, um, you know, the equipment rental place um, just because I had done work with MQ and audiovisual that you guys probably both know. And um, so because I had sort of gotten my feet wet, you know, just doing remote fly packs and switching and blah, blah, blah. Uh, when it came time to for more like mainstream industry stuff, I ended up just getting jobs as sort of a, you know, technical coordinator slash production manager, uh, which was still relatively entry entry level. Very cool. What what I would say, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, there is all kinds of work out there to get in. You can go again to like events or to. Uh, lighting and grip companies, um, camera houses, can, you know, there's, yeah. and just get, and they have a lot of jobs, you know, they, they, they need people like, Hey, I'll, I'll come in. And when you've got that huge package coming back or going out, I'll, I'll you know, I'll come in and work for, for a minute. And that's a great way to learn gear. It's yeah. a great way to get to, to understand those kinds of companies uh, and how important they are and how they integrate into productions. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and that's, you know, was, really vital for me is just, you know, working with those kinds of kinds of companies to begin with. Like, like in McEwen, I got a lot of breaks from that. Yep. Yep. And to take your mind away from having to be on a set, mm -hmm. it's not where you're going to begin. If you're lucky, like Debbie, you can, but a lot of people aren't that lucky. And so take those barriers off and say, okay, I can, and follow what you love. That's the other thing I would say. Follow your heart. If you're really into documentary work, find that documentary filmmaker in your backyard and offer your services for free. If you're not, if you're into sports, find that that sport that you love and find where that's at. And you know, there's just, it, and if you do, it will it will the path will open up because your heart will follow it. There's there's tons of work out there. You just have to go out, and as Joel said, you have to to call people. Hey. You have to knock on the door and, yeah. and, and don't be shy about it. Cause they did that too. You know, don't, don't worry, like oh, go for man. it. You know, <laughs> it is fine. Like, I mean, don't, don't feel weird about, you know, reaching out, sending an email, you know, the, the industry is really heavy on LinkedIn. Um, I know it, it can seem a little, you know, silly, but, but LinkedIn is, is a great industry thing. Um, and, you know, re reach out, you know, and another thing I would say too is read the trades. Uh, I, I, I love the trades. Um, and, and especially if you go online, they have a lot of notices. I noticed someone asked about like, how do I find out about what's happening in my area? A lot of the trades will show all the different things in production and you can see, uh, and I'm talking about like, you know, you guys can talk about all the different trades that you like, but, um, you know, and those are available to everyone. And you can see all the starts and what's happening and where and when it begins, who the production office is and all that stuff. 
and, and also, you know, talk to your local film commission. A lot of times they, they, they have internships and stuff like that listed there um, because they're giving out the, you know, the permits and working with the crews that are coming into town. Um, so they'll know everything that's happening. Very cool. Um, quick side note for everybody who's tuning in, if you have any questions, shoot them to the chat box. We're going to get them uh, to them in a minute. Um, I'm going to ask you guys about uh, unions really quickly, like SAG and other unions. What are your thoughts on them? I mean, I can talk a lot about unions. <laughs> Back to Debbie. Talk for babies about the unions. <laughs> Debbie, you're, you're, you're in the Director's Guild. I am in the Director's Guild. And what what are the pros and cons of that, and, and what are the projects that got you into it? Um, well, it's funny. I kind of went in kicking and screaming uh, originally. I had been asked to join on a film that I did in 1999 uh, with Finn Taylor. We were both in, invited to join the Guild at the time, him as a director and me as a production manager. And we decided to pass on that opportunity. Um I was I didn't feel quite ready and and I don't think he did either. Um, we decided to wait till the next film that we did. We made a pact to do to wait till the next film we did together. We were going to join, and so five years later, we joined the guild together. And he actually the the production paid my join fees. I I um, and I was quite ready at that time. The difference between not being in the guild and being in the guild is huge. I mean, it's, it's, it, I, it was a career maker. My mentor, Ned Kopp, um, it pushed me and pushed me and pushed me for a long time to join the guild. And he was really not happy with me when I didn't join the first time. But, but then, you know, he got it. And I think it made a huge difference in my career. I don't think I could do anything that I wouldn't have had nearly the career I had without being part of the union. Um, and I don't see any downsides to being uh, a, a guild member. I don't see any downsides to being to joining any of the unions. If, if that's your passion and you and you want to be a, um, a guild member, I think that that's something that you should do. Um, and, and especially because you'll probably get more work that way if you want to work in movies and television. Um, because where we, you know, if you if you're not in a guild. You know, you, we hire non-union, and it's the P, the PAs are non-union. And eventually, though, those PAs turn into crew members in one department or another, and they become guild members or or union members, depending upon the craft or the trade. And I and I don't see I don't see a downside to any of the any of the the unions, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I think that like the Screen Actors Guild, for example, SAG-AFTRA. It's, I mean, I think that they do more and people just staying on it to get health insurance, <laughs> but you know, they, they, the unions definitely offer really, really helpful health insurance and retirement. And they're, they're, they've been a really important part of the industry in terms of keeping at least mainstream production somewhat honest about not going too far or having to pay if they're going to go to, you know, 12, 15, 18 hours, um, all that stuff in, in, in on productions. Um, and I think that like for people that are looking at the industry, you know, think about, you know, if you're, if you're going to work in mainstream, um, entertainment that, that, you know, let's say you're going to be, a, you know, a assistant camera person, focus puller, that sort of thing, DP, you know, a lot of look into those unions that can be another like great place to sort of pick the path that you want. Like I'm really ca passionate about camera work. Okay. So what's the union like that for? Um, or like, I really want to be a writer. Okay. So let's think about like what the WGA has to offer uh, and, and, and think about that a little bit. Um, and, and that, or, you know, I'm, I'm producing, you know, I've got a couple of production manager credits now. Do I want to join the producers guild? What are the pros and cons to that? And, you know, long-term, um, you know, in retirement savings, all that healthcare, they're, they're really good. You know, well, the, the producers guild is not a guild or a union. Oh yeah. Not really. I mean, more of an association. You think an association It is not technically a guild or a union. They don't do collective bargaining. They don't um, have, pension, health, and welfare requirements, or, or, or nor, nor do they give you health coverage um, or a pension. Um, they well, they're the ones battling against SAG, right? <laughs> well, they're, they're often they are, but that's not what they're battling against. They're usually 
there or it's not just SAG, it's the DGA, the IA, and the Teamsters. They're always sort of trying to shovel proverbial shit against that tide. Good luck, fellas. You know, I'm a, I'm a producer too, but I'm also a member of the DGA. And a lot of producers are also members of the, the Director's Guild. Um, and some of them are even members of SAG. And I've known, if, you know, I mean, I've known producers that were uh, members, that were Teamsters. Um, you know, Jim Brubaker was a Teamster, and he was a big-time producer and was, in, was a head of Universal Studio, or uh, Universal, for a while. So it's not, you know, there, it's a little bit... Um, hey, Ronald Reagan was the uh, head of the Screen Actors Guild. That was yeah. his first elected office. Yeah, I mean, I'm a must-join. I'll never be on screen again. Yeah. Because I have a desire to join. But I, I, was in, I, I, I was in enough shows that I got that letter. I'll never forget getting that letter and laughing, thinking, well, they're not going to get a send out of me because I'm not joining. <laughs> you know, and it's not possible to belong to more than one union either. So, you know, I mean, you, you can, you can d definitely do that or not. You know, I know a number of people who produce corporate video. Um, you know, I have a friend, my friend Brian Benson, for example, he produces a lot of corporate video, and he's an assistant director, and he's not in the guild, but he, he's um, worked on a number of features that I've produced that were not union pictures, and so he worked, he was, he was an AD that I worked with. Um, and then I've got other ADs, though, that are working non-union, but they aspire to join. So, you know, it's, uh, and, and I hope that they do. I hope that they join the guild because I think that, you know, as a career choice, you know, if you want to be an assistant director, if you want to be a production manager, if you want to, if you want to uh, be a director, you have to join the guild. I mean, in order to keep getting work. That's what I think also. I think I've never joined any guild. I, I think I've been on one movie set that Debbie had me on when we were doing that, that movie for uh, Ma Manu, right? Yeah. This is not my thing. I never want I'm not a big joiner. Mm -hmm. But I didn't, I don't want to be on movies. They're too long. I want like a week and then I want to go do something else or two days or a day. I want to be here. I want to be there. That was always my goal, right? Always. And so, I didn't want to join a guild, but I think if you're going to be a professional and be on a movie set and be making movies, boy, you better get in and figure that stuff out because they don't let you on unless you join. It's that simple. You can't work unless you join their, their thing, and I think it's good. It protects the people inside of the industry. It's the Wild West out there sometimes. Yeah. It's, it can be brutal, and if you have somebody behind your back as a freelancer, without a guild, without something like that, I'm the only person that can speak up for me. But when you have that, you have some power. And I think if you're going to be serious about being in the movie-making industry, whether that be in New York or L.A. or on the road, yeah, you better figure out those, those places. Give them a call. They want to see you. Mm-hmm. Very, very informative. Um, thank you, guys. So we're going to move on to some of the questions that we got in the chat box. Um, so one of the first ones, what was the biggest mistake you made coming up and how do you feel about it now? Was there anything you learned, like a big lesson learned? God. Or a funny story you got out of it now? Wow. <laughs> I can talk about it. I can talk about, um, a mis about mistakes and First of all, don't be afraid to make mistakes because everybody does. And I think that one of the things that I always felt like was that if I made, if I, if I felt like I had, when I took a job and I hated it, that I had to stick it out. And I did a lot of those. And for one fine day, I decided I was mad as hell and not going to take it anymore. And I quit a job. I quit one of the biggest jobs I ever got because I thought that the producer was a big a hole <laughs> and I really you know and and the rest and it was a huge picture and the and the um, rest of the crew was aghast that I had walked away from it. and that, but at the same time they had so much respect for me because they knew that they were working for one of the biggest jerks that ever walked and I was 
close enough to the top that that big jerk was just, you know, like I couldn't deal with it anymore. And I, and I quit. And, um, I never, and I, and I thought I made this baby suicide. And then I realized that people quit jobs from, from, you know, working bad movies all the time. People get fired off of movies all the time. A really good friend of mine is a somewhat famous, you know, in my world as an assistant director, he's like one of the top drawer and he's been fired a bunch of times you know, <laughs> by directors that were just, you know, for whatever reason decided to fire him. And it doesn't mean that he wouldn't be any, and he works for those people again. And he works. And so it, don't be afraid to make mistakes and don't be afraid to walk away from a job that where you don't feel comfortable or you feel you're being mistreated. You will work again. And I, and I think you have to have respect for yourself. I'm not saying that you should, you know, that you should have these lofty ideas. And if you're, and if you get a hangnail, you should quit. I'm saying that you, you know, in your gut, you know, when you're not in the right place at the right time. And if people are mistreating you, there's no reason to stay. You know, there really isn't. Don't let anybody mistreat you, which is why I am sort of a union rah-rah, because I feel the union has your back and they make, you know, they, they make, they put a, bo they, they put a, a box around you that's a protection, not a hindrance. And PAs are not union. And so they, they sometimes get the benefit of the union protection because of all the people around them our union, so the union rules hold sway. But you know that also, if you, if somebody's mistreating you, though, it's not worth it. It's just not. So have some self-respect, and always have some self-respect. And that it will. And that is, you know. So and if you make a big mistake, own up to it. You know. And if they don't like it, that's too bad. Because I've always, you know, it's one of those things. Is it's. It's always about solutions and not about problems, at least in my world. Yeah. And I and I know that mistakes happen. And so for me, if someone owns up to if somebody makes a big faux pas or a big mistake, I I'm gonna say, Okay, let's fix this. Let's let's not dwell, not point fingers, not, you know, yell, scream and holler and kick your feet. You fix it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean I I think that like it's just sort of bounce off what you're saying a little bit, Debbie, is, is you know, trust your gut and, and, and take a chance. Right. So like especially when you're starting off, like, you know, take a chance. I, one big mistake I made, which is kind of a funny story, is um, when I first moved to L.A., I was I had gotten this like nine to five job paid really well, um, but it was boring and I hated it. And it, but it was on the Fox lot and I loved it, but it was, it was, it really was not right for me. And at, it was some of the reach outs I had been making before I moved to LA came through. And one of them uh, was uh, said, Hey, look, if you want a job on this Buffy the Vampire Slayer show, you can have it. And it was a pretty good job. And I'm like, that show is not going anywhere. <laughs> but at the same time, I, and I'm like, who's the director? That guy, no way. So I didn't take the job and it was from his agent. So I would have been working directly with Joss Whedon. Um, and I really regret that. <laughs> and I think what that really came down to was getting you know, I'm like, okay, I found a place of comfort. Don't, don't move. You know, I could pay my rent, got my own apartment, live in a cool part of LA. This is great. But that wasn't, I really hadn't moved down there to be comfortable, you know, and, and I really needed, I should have taken that job and, you know, I, I, that was a big mistake. And so, you know, don't, don't get too comfortable take and take chances. <laughs> That's some good advice right there. Take chances. Cause you have to risk, you yeah. have to risk in this business. Um, anything in life. I mean, in no life. risk for no reward, you know, yeah. rich dad, poor dad, right. You know, you got to like, you know, you make, you make, you, you got to believe you. in it. You just can't be in doing mm -hmm. empty risks. Yeah. You yeah. Believe in what you're doing and that you're, <clears throat> I'll give a little more direct advice. My, one of my biggest mistakes was my mouth, <laughs> my mouth on the job. All right, so I'm, I'm working a, a job where I'm interviewing a judge up in Idaho, real nice guy, and it's a, it's a crime show, and we get him in his courtroom, and we get the cameras rolling. It's an hour interview, and he's terrible. 
He's a terror. He goes off on tangents. He goes down that road. And it's an hour because I need an hour to get what I need. I'm editing in my head as I'm interviewing him. So we finally get done. I thank him a big smile and I send him on his way. And he goes into his little back room and I get on the phone immediately to the producer in a, in a huge COV move, cover my ass, CMB. I really uh, was on the phone loud. Hey, yeah, you blah, 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 you know, and telling her what a terrible interview he was and how he went up on <laughs> tangents. And I look up and the crew is making kind of some hand noises to me, but I don't pay any attention. I'm on a roll in the courtroom, by the way, like just pacing back and forth. He had come back into the courtroom and he heard <laughs> everything I said. <laughs> That's a huge lesson. Did I need to do that? No. I didn't need to call her. I didn't need to, the cover my ass was a complete failure. And from that point on, I really started watching my words on the set. When I come on a set, it's like uh, you try to put a cloak on. That doesn't mean you don't have fun and everything, but you just are aware of what's going on and what your words can do. That's all. That's super great advice. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's a good piece of advice to remember. Uh, so I know, uh, Robin, you answered this um, for Justin in our chat, but just to throw it to Debbie and Joel, what do you look for in people that you put on cruise? I want somebody that's willing to work as hard as I do. You know, and I, because I know that I work hard. And I think that that's really important. And I know, I can tell by talking to somebody in a very short period of time whether they're a hard worker or not. And I want, and I also, but I, and I want them to be loyal and I want them to be enthusiastic and I want them to have a good sense of humor, you know, because I have the curse of the easily amused. So that's not too hard by me. I, and I want people that, um, that, you know, that know how to, know how to do their they don't necessarily have to know how to do the job they have to want to know how to do the job and that's really what counts because sometimes you know having enthusiastic people is that that don't know as much as people who know a whole lot and are jaded but not enthusiastic i take the enthusiastic people over the other ones any day of the week yeah i mean there's there's different things you're looking for from from different people in different situations. I've done a lot of crewing and I was a production manager where people call up and they'd say, uh, I've got, I want to shoot a thing and I need, you know, X, Y, and Z. And so I would, you know, had a roster of DPs and I kind of felt like a matchmaker a little bit. I would say, okay, so who are you? And, you know, okay, you've asked me, you've called me 20 times. You've got a lot of questions. I should probably, I need to give you maybe not the most technically proficient guy who's maybe a little grumpy. You need a softer touch. So I'm going to give you softer touch guy uh, for, or like someone's like, Oh, I'm not sure what's going to happen. And uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, then I need to give you um, take charge person who's going to be a little bit louder and drive you a little bit. Um, and so I think that there's, there's, you know, a real art to sort of producing crews and putting crews together. They're going to work well together and sort of finding the, the right kind of fit for um, who you're looking for. I, mean, I think for me, like sometimes, I, you know, in a certain type of production, I want a couple of loud, surly guys around me to sort of help diffuse guys that like to talk and or guys or gals, you know, that, that can sort of take the edge off me while I'm like reviewing notes or something. Or on other things, I want a really quiet person. I want a quiet audio guy, um, you know, a, a quiet DP, um, because if just we're walking into, you know, an uptight corporate situation and I just don't want to have to deal with, you know, telling them to be quiet or, you know, making sure that they dress appropriately or whatever. So it really depends on, on each situation. And I think for, you know, the people on the cruise, it's important you know, one thing I was sort of thinking about is, is like, no matter who I'm going for, be careful on the like scuttlebutt and the chit chat and the like ongoing, like, oh, did you hear that thing last week? It's like, just save that for afterwards when you're having a beer, you know, keep it, keep it quiet and simple on set because 
you know, I think for me, especially if I'm producing on set, like I, I just have a lot on my mind and I really need to, um, you okay. know, focus and concentrate, you know, and, yeah. and if someone has a lot to say, it can be really distracting, even if it's a conversation I want to be in. Absolutely. I think that's exactly right there. It, every job for, for at least from my experience is a cherry picked who's going to, first of all, where are we going? What are we doing? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the job that's the uh, embedded with the Border Patrol is going to be completely different from the job of the guy who collects macaroni and cheese boxes. Right. And believe me, those can come within a month of each other or a week or two days. I mean, it, so it really depends. And sometimes you, you're picking a crew to help a certain person that's already on the job. So if, uh, if the job comes with a director of photography or a director, those people are going to have their people that they like. And, you're gonna, and, and so that's a natural fit, at least here for us, for directors of photography. They have a gaffer they like to work with. And if that person's not available, they have another one. And that, those gaffers all have key grips and, and, and grips that they work with. So it's not like I'm having to, you know, invent everything from the beginning. There's a certain cascade effect that happens, but the most important from the beginning is the director. That starts there. Wonderful. Okay, so we have Eric tuning in from Texas. Hello, Eric. And he asks, you mentioned that the PA works with talents. What are some do's and don'ts when trying to reach out to PAs for an opportunity to audition? And is an experienced voice actor always a must? Hmm. Sounds like a couple different topics there. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I think in, it, so. PA is working with talent. A production assistant working with talent. The talent is hired on the set. The talent is already there, and the PA would be assisting that particular talent. That there are two different roles there. You're not going to be talent now. In in dealing with talent on a set. There are specific things, but I'm not sure that's the question. So I'm not, I, right? So those are just two different things right there. Yeah, I mean, I, I having like been on some sets with some pretty famous people, I, I think that like you, it is important to be careful with them. And I think that like, you know, don't, <laughs> there's a, why when I worked on the Fox lot in, in Los Angeles, there was, there was a PA on the Sunday morning football show, right? And so Terry Bradshaw's there. He's got like six Super Bowl rings or whatever. Catching a pass from Terry Bradshaw's trick, right? And so the guy <laughs> brings a football the first day and he's like, man, would you please like throw me a pass? And, and Bradshaw's like, uh, okay. And he's like, can you catch a good pass? And the guy's, the guy's like, yeah, absolutely. Throw me a pass. And so Bradshaw whips a pass at him and you don't realize how hard these guys throw, right? And it goes right through his hands and breaks his nose. And, so, and, and this poor guy. So like next thing, next work day, wide company thing. Uh, dear all Fox employees, please do not, you know, we have many people visiting. Uh, please don't arm wrestle Arnold Schwarzenegger or ask a UFC fighter to punch you in the face. And cause you know, people ask Mike Tyson, for example, to hit him all the time. Like, please hit me. You don't, don't do that when, when they come. Cause they're, it's important too to remember they're at work. Right. And so this is something I, I, I've told people before, like, yeah, you know who that is, but they are at work and, you know, you can chit chat with them, maybe, you know, a cup of coffee, house commute, that's fine. But like, really, you know, don't get too into it with them. They might be nice about it, but really you're draining their energy. They're going to have to go and, and deliver on camera. And if they just got into it with you and you've been like, what'd you do on that thing? Oh my God. And they're like, they're getting into it. But at the same time, like that's not really serving the production well because, you know, they need to like be quiet and chill and then go out and do their thing. Um, so be careful about getting too chatty and, um, and, and too up in their business, no matter how nice they are. And including directors, by the way, I've been on so many sets where I need my director to be focused. And yeah. then somebody from the crew comes up and they start totally. to get, and the director is easily, easily distracted. Mm -hmm. It's part of their makeup sometimes. And yeah. all of a sudden I'm watching, I'm, I'm, I got 10 minutes. They're having this little chit chat and I'm behind schedule. And I'm furious because the person has no idea and they should know better. 
Uh, it is a big thing on the set to, to that chit chat thinks a big yeah. thing. Yeah, air, air towards, you know, being a little quieter. A little, little quieter on the set and, <laughs> and respectful of the person. But I mean, I think that, you know, talent, talent on the set's a, a, a sticky wicket. You can get in trouble. I've no, spent days with, with talent and some of them are super nice. But you, you have to just yeah. watch your, your P's and My, Q's. Really mind your P's and Q's. Be very careful um, with, with, with all those people. I, I've definitely made some mistakes before and I had a weird joke or whatever. And I'm like, that, that was totally an unforced error. You know, I didn't need to do that. You know, be, be quiet, be chill. Um, even if you have a bigger personality, it just, you know, let, let that come out after years of knowing them <laughs> versus uh, the first day, no matter how nice they are. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. I have learned an incredible amount of information. You guys have been fantastic. And thank you for being here tonight. Tonight, this afternoon, wherever you are, I'm in Orlando. So it's, it's nighttime here. <laughs> uh, um, and to our audience, uh, let us know. Let us know what you'd like to hear, topics that you'd like us to cover in future webcasts. Um, please let us know. And thank you so much for joining us on the um, shoots.com web, uh, webcast this evening. And I hope you all have a fantastic evening, afternoon, evening, wherever right. you are. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Sarah. Bye, Bye. Robin. Thank you. Bye, guys. You might be looking at Shoot Stop video and thinking, so how does this all work? Is this about A, setting up the whole crew for me, B, just giving me options and having me handle it, or C, something in between? Well, it's D, all of the above. To put it simply, we're here to help you in any way that we can to get the crew and talent you need for your next production. We believe that every level of video production can benefit from a well-maintained list of qualified crew members for every position. This goes for pre-pro, on set, and for post. Every project is different, so if you need a producer to help manage the decision-making process, then we can totally do that. If you're already a producer and want to build your own crew from scratch, then go for it. We're here to make your next production a success. And if you are crew or talent looking for producers that want you, then you've come to the right place. Sign up now and also leave a referral for any solid people that you know that are already on here. Thank you for considering ShootStop Video and happy shooting!